Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Winnipeg Sports Talk YouTube channel. My name is Connor Rabjack. Today, I'm joined by Jacob Stoller. We've got a really fun YouTube video planned today. We're going to be doing hot takes for the Winnipeg Jets. The 2024-25 season is right around the corner. We've each got three of our hottest takes that we're going to be sharing here on this episode. But before we get into that, Jacob, how are you doing today? Doing good, doing good. I'm very, very blessed and thrilled the preseason is over. That was so boring. And uh, let's get to the real games. Yeah, no kidding. Um, and Jacob, of course, is from WST Sunday Live. Myself, Liz Hood, and Jacob, we're there every single Sunday at 9 a.m. on the WST YouTube channel. We've had two episodes already. It's a live show. The chat is always bumping. If you haven't joined us yet, make sure you're joining us this Sunday at 9 a.m. We're going to be previewing the Jets season. And then next Sunday, we'll have games to talk about. So we're super excited to launch that show. Everyone has enjoyed it. But without further ado, let's get into this video which is the Winnipeg Jets hot takes. And Jacob, you're the guest. I'll let you go first. And I also, you know, you can set the tone on how hot these takes are, but I'll let you go first with your first hot take for the Jets this season. All right. Well, let's start it off scorching hot. Scorching I predict hot. that Connor Hellebuck will play less than 60 games this year. And the reason for that is pretty simple. I think that fatigue is going to come and affect Connor Hellebuck. We saw it in the last two years where the Jets defense basically collapsed and really put him through the ringer. The last 10 playoff games, so he had an 878 save percentage. I think that for anyone that watched that series, we all realized that Hellbuck was being kind of thrown to the wolves. And the body of work that Connor Hellbuck has gone through is pretty its pretty insane. Like, the last seven years, Hellbuck ranks first in games played, minutes, saves, and also tied first for shutouts. But the point being is that's a massive workload that this guy's undertaken. This year with the Four Nations Cup, and I would presume Hellbuck is the inside track to be USA's goalie. Whether it's him finally saying that he'll take certain nights off or the Jets kind of cautioning Hellebuck in certain ways. Obviously, they don't have the best backup ever in Kako Kapitan, kind of unproven. But still, I think for their own good and for the longevity of the season, Hellebuck can't be playing every single night. Because if you think about it, his all-star break, so to speak, he'll be in intense best-on-best -best hockey. And then two months later in a playoff series, it doesn't seem feasible to me. I think we'll see less than 60 games for Bucky. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that that is that is starting off hot. And I think it's a hot take because, you know, Hellebuck in the past, we've heard both like coaches and media, they've all kind of said that, like, if Hellebuck wants to play, he's going to play. And it's more like up to him. And I know that he's the kind of goalie that's going to want to play more than 60 games and in the Four Nations Cup and every game in the playoffs. And is the Jets coaching staff going to be able to kind of dial him back a little bit? His Eight year or sorry, seven year, eight point five million dollar per season contract kicks in this year along with Mark Shifley. So I think now would be a great time for the Jets to kind of go away from that in a sense and and dial back the games a little bit because of the the fatigue factor factor that you mentioned. And a lot of Jets fans, again, every single year in the playoffs, especially that this last year especially, the defense in front of him cratered, but Connor Hellebuck also struggled in those games. It wasn't just one or the other. It was a little bit of both. So we'll see if the Jets learn from that a little bit. And and I could I could totally see it heading into next year. Let's get into my first hot take. Um, and this is the one I am the most confident in. And I'm bringing it up first. Yes, out, out of my three, this is the one I'm the most confident in. And I've got a lot of numbers here. But in the Jets' history, since they moved back in 2011, they've had 340 goal scorers. Kyle Connor in 2021-22 with 47, Patrick Laine had 44 in 2017-18, and Mark Shifley had 42 two years ago in 2022-23, and Gabriel Velarde is going to join them this year. I'm predicting Damn. that Gabriel, Gabriel Velarde scores over 40 goals for the Winnipeg Jets, and last year he played 47 games and had 22 goals. That's a 30 old 38 goal pace over the course of the season. We'll get into the health later because that's obviously like the number one thing that would derail this. Um, he's heading into a contract year. He's a pending RFA. Uh, the power play runs through him. Liz Hood and I just did a deep dive and he is dynamite on the power play. And I have a crazy stat, Jacob. This is going to blow your mind. But Gabriel Velarde, since the Jets moved back, is the number one power play goals per 60 player in the Winnipeg Jets history, more than Patrick Line. He's at 3.5, and Line is at 3.2 power play goals per 60. So on a per 60 rate, he's the best power play threat the Jets have ever had since they come back. He leads wow. the he led the Jets in power play goals last year with nine, despite only playing 47 games. 
Um, Mark Sheffy was second with six. So he played half the season, had nine power play goals, and led the team by three. Um, and his goals per 60 in all situations. This is my favorite one. This this is this is crazy. Since the Jets moved back in 2011, his goals per 60 are best in Jets history at 1.65. He's the on a per 60 basis, he's the best goal scorer since the Jets moved back. And he's only played 47 games. I get it. There's not a massive sample size, but I I we did the deep dive, Liz Hood and I, and I was I brought up that he's the best power play threat the Jets have had since Patrick Line. Then you take into effect the goals per 60 number, both on the power play and in all situations. He was at a 38 goal pace last year. I think health is the only thing standing in Gabriel Vlardy's way this year. And in a contract year, if he's able to put up more than 40 goals, the Jets might be opening their checkbooks at the end of the year. Um, but that is my hot take. Gabriel Vlardy scores over 40 goals. Jacob, what do you think? Well, while we're throwing out stats here, uh, like we're at a buffet, I will say that <laughs> since the start of the 22-23 season, Velarde ranks tied for 12th in 5-on-5 five five goals per 60 minutes. I I think the only thing that would come... Okay, health. Like, let's just... Yes. We know it. Like, that's yes. the biggest thing. But also, like, he's kind of a nasty passer. Like, Scott O'Neill talked about that recently, yep. too. And the only thing that would maybe come short like, I think he's a lock for 30 goals maybe though he gets 40 assists if he kind of finds a sweet spot with KC um, but I like the bet I, I think that velarde has been maybe the most impressive guy throughout the duration of training camp this year mm-hmm. where we know what Kyle Connor can do Mark Shifley all these guys Josh Morrissey but and while we know a bit what Gabe Velarde can do in practices like you're seeing this guy like this shooter's mentality that is really really eye-popping and it's not even just in a sweet spot in front of the net, but also off the rush in certain instances as well. I agree, man. Gabe the babe is primed for a big year. Okay. Okay. So I, I've convinced you. I don't know. Let us know in the comments below. Jacob had his first take. Hellbuck plays less than 60 games. I had my next one. Gabriel Vlardy scores over 40 goals for the Winnipeg Jets this year. 40 or more, let's say. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm all in on what Gabriel Vlardy can do this year. And the Jets are going to be paying up for it at the end of the year if he wants to remain a Winnipeg Jet, as it is a contract year. Jacob, you have two other hot takes. Let's throw it back to you, whichever one you want to go with. Uh, What is your next Winnipeg Jets hot take for this upcoming season? Nikolai Ehlers will be traded before the trade deadline. I want to remind everyone of an interesting situation that happened a couple of years ago. Remember when uh, Andrew Kopp, was on the Jets in 21-22. The Jets were about four or six points out of the playoff spot. On the outside looking in, they still had a chance, but I think we all knew it wasn't the Jets here. And the Jets made a decision to trade Andrew Kopp in a deal that brought them, I think it was like, the Brad Lambert pick was from that trade, was it not? Yep. So Brad Lambert, um, which was great, and Morgan Barron, and uh, I think there was another even pick involved there as well. Great trade. The reason I'm making this prediction is I think that the Jets will probably be in the thick of a playoff spot when the maybe this is another hot take in itself, but around that time, I think that they're going to have to realize if we don't know this guy's going to sign, we need to trade him. But better yet, I don't know if the Jets are that gung ho about signing Nikolai Ehlers. Nikolai Ehlers and this contract is not going to age well. Nikolai Ehlers' bread and butter is his speed. His wheels are going to fall off in a couple of years. You want to give a complaint about Mark Shifley's deal. Mark Shifley's a player that's going to age well. Mark Shifley, even when his mobility and certain things slow down, you'll still get surplus value from a player that's extremely cerebral and can pass and distribute and facilitate because of his brain. Nikolai Ehlers, you know, I'm not saying he's got a bad brain or anything, but his raw talent is the allure with him. And I think we're going to see a drop-off, especially when he's in his 30s. So I don't think the Jets are totally convinced of signing him, especially if Ehlers has an idea he can get an 8 by 8 or whatever it may be on the open market. So with all that said... I think Ehlers will be traded. I don't think they'll finish the year as a Winnipeg Jet. Of course, if they're in first place, I don't see them going out and doing it. But I don't think they'll be in first place like they were last year. So for that reason, and from where I kind of think the Jets will be, I believe Ehlers will be traded. Okay, okay. I I won't say I'm I'm on board with it because I think... Like, I don't disagree. Let me just put it that way. I do think, you know, the deployment that Nikolai Ehlers has gone under his entire tenure here as a Winnipeg Jet always being on the second line, always being on the second power play. This year, he's on the top power play, and there were some alleged good conversations between him and Scott O'Neill over the offseason. I get that. Is it enough to change his mind and make him almost want to stay in a second line, first power play role? 
uh, if that's what he's going to be doing over these next eight years, I'm not sure. But I think there's a lot more evidence to suggest that he will be gone this year rather than still here. So hey, I, he hates I, when I ask him about his contract. Yes, yeah. Well, he hates when any anyone asks him about yes, his contract, not just not just, not just you, exactly. Um, but yeah, but Connor, should the Jets even sign Ealer? So that's the other thing I brought up. Depends like, the price. Like he's a sixty you have point to player. Any deal hypothetically here is seven or eight years. UFA, yeah. it's such an it's, interesting it's, it's such an interesting negotiation because he's been a 60 point player but there's always the what ifs of like what if he got the Kyle O'Connor treatment right what if he was on the power play every year um maybe he's an eight million dollar player um if mm-hmm. over eight years right um I don't know I don't know if they should I think that's a a different conversation because like you said he is what 28 right now gonna be turning 29 um and this is the time when players cash in big but the Jets might not want to do that um, so it's it's interesting, but I'm I'm leaning towards with you on that. I'm not as as all in on the fact that Ehlers won't be here next year, but I'm definitely let's say 55 45 in in that camp. I got one foot in each camp, but more on your side. Let's get into my next hot take here. And if you're enjoying the video so far, make sure you've hit the like button, the subscribe, and the notification bell. We've got a ton of great content. I brought up the WST Sunday lives every single Sunday. If you hit that notification bell, you'll get a notification every time we go live. So make sure you've hit that. My next hot take, and it's going to be interesting because my first take and this one are going to be both hard to hit because these two players are on two separate forward lines. <laughs> um, so they can't really like stack off of one another. But he had the contract hold out. Cole Perfetti scores over 60 points this season. Last year, in 71 games, he had 19 goals, 19 assists, and 38 points. Um, over an 82 game pace, it's not much higher, obviously, but that's 22 goals, 22 assists, 44 points in an 82 game sample. I think over the first half of last year, Cole Perfetti was a 60 point player. Then he hit the wall. Then he kind of was used in a fourth line role at times and never really gained the trust of Rick bonus. I think you could see Cole Perfetti get off to a slower start this year, given the fact he missed the first four or five days of training camp along with the first two preseason games. Um, and I, I do think that even if he starts slow, he's going to ascend and be that player he was in the first half of last year more than he was the second half. Um, I brought up all these statistics of, you know, Gabriel Velarde. I'm going to bring up some more for Cole Perfetti. He's ninth in assists per 60 in Jets history. Again, Jets history, Jets 2.0 history, I should keep clarifying. Since they moved back in 2011, he's ninth highest. He's at 1.392 assists per 60. Kyle Connor is at one4 so he's right in that range in terms of a per 60 minute basis on assists. Kyle Connor's had some big time assists here. Obviously, he's had 40 goal seasons as well, Kyle Connor. But I think Cole Perfetti is going to be in that 40, 45 assist range this year. And then we know he has 20 goal potential as he almost hit it last year. Um, and he's the fifth highest active jet in assists per 60 as well. So I think. Even though he's going to be on the second line, which will be a little bit sheltered, he'll be on that second power play unit, which won't get as many minutes. I still think he has the talent and the ability to maybe go 20 goals, 40 assists, or 17 goals and 43 assists. Something in that range that gets him over 60 points. And then obviously next year would be another contract year as he just signed the two-year deal. Um, But Cole Perfetti, that's my second hot take, records over 60 points. Jacob, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um... I just don't – how many NHL players score 60-plus points on the second power play unit plus second line? Yeah. That's where that I'm a little fair. bit yep. – like, I could see him scoring at, like, a 60-point pace at some points, like, total – or for most of the year. Mm-hmm. I think if if Cole Perfetti was on the first power play unit, um, I can buy into this more. But I think, for me, I'm more so gauging a 20 and 20 um, – sorry – uh, 20 and 30 type of season, maybe around 50 points as like something I could see him breaking. Mm-hmm. Don't think it'll be 60 points this year. Maybe 50 is kind of there, but I, uh, I'm i not the most uh, convinced that he's okay. going to get the 60 point mark this year. You mentioned Gabe Villari scoring 40. I see that like bang, like that that's going to happen uh, or could come very close to happening. I'm not there yet on Perfetti. Uh, okay. I, I don't know if that's because he... I just don't know what he is right now. Like, I don't know also the deployment of that second line. I'm a huge totally. believer in Cole Perfetti, always will be, but uh, I'm I'm not buying that. If you were to ask me to invest in that stock, I would 
okay. absolutely liquidate it in a heartbeat. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. I don't know. I think the fact that he struggled so much in the second half of last year and was still at a 44-point pace over the course of the season. Like, maybe he overshot his uh, expectation in the first half of the season, but he well undershot it in the second half. So I think it balances out a little bit more. And like you said, if he's around 50, I think maybe there will be some opportunities for him on the top line if that top line struggles like they did last year. Maybe the top power play unit has some moments where they struggle as well and he gets up there. Cole Perfetti, I think, goes over 60 points. We'll leave it at that. Jacob, your last hot take here as we are rolling through our 2024-25 Winnipeg Jets hot takes. What is your last take, sir? Neil Pionk will have a bounce back season. Poor guy had a unimaginable tragedy happen during the year last year with his yeah. best friend, Adam Johnson, um, dying tragically in that uh, accident over in England, the on ice incident. And, you know, I I've thought about this a lot over the summer, but especially when Scott O'Neill mentioned in one of the, the preseason press conferences, like that's a hard thing to go through. Yeah. And then you just kind of are back in the mix of it. And like, I, I think that anyone that has either gone through grief or loss can attest to how hard it is. And just to think that you go back into a job profession where everyone's watching and criticizing you. Um, that's not to say Neil Pionk the year before hadn't shown signs of me being uh, overmatched in the top for a role, but a lot of people I talked to around the NHL, people that frequent Jets games scouting for the organizations or other people and other organizations that come through Winnipeg, a lot of them, they believe that Neil Pionk's the second best defenseman on this team. And, you know, I, I kind of don't hate that. I think that we have to remember that's more so on ability as mm -hmm. it is. Like, Neil Pionk, an undersized defenseman, is excellent at closing off gaps, killing plays. He has mobility and the ability to move the puck as well. He has all the tools to do it. I think that we saw it in the 2020-21 year, uh, the, the COVID year, how great he can be. It was obviously against you know just Canadian teams, but yeah. I believe in Neil Pionk. I think he'll come back with a vengeance and have a really good year. Now, a bounce back year for me is going to be because let's handicap it. So let, let's let's put some sort of goal posts. For I sure. think he'll be over 50% on the shot share, expected goal share, goals for share, nice. um, models at five on five. I think he'll log a solid amount of minutes, and I think he will even chipping a couple of points on PP2. Like, I, I, I'm a believer in Neil Pionk. I think that it just makes too much sense that he'll bounce back, um, kind of with a vengeance, rather. And, you know, I, I don't think it's fair for him to be the whipping boy. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that. And especially the, the human element, the off-ice element that he went through last year, I could not agree more. Having to go through that in the middle of the season, um, coming off of a rough year the year before uh, from an on-ice perspective, just a lot of piling on Neil Pionk last year. And I think I think he does bounce back this year. And from an on-ice perspective, you know, Brendan Dillon leaves in free agency. Dylan Sandberg's going to step up to that second pair. And while I do think maybe Brendan Dillon is going to post stronger results than Dylan Sandberg will in that role, I'm a believer in Dylan Sandberg. And I think that that pairing is going to be a better puck-moving duo than Dylan and Pionk were. Because I think Sk Sandberg's a little bit better of a skater than Dylan. I think he can move the puck better. Now, no one's think better. That Sandberg can move the puck better than Dylan? I do. I do. And I, I think Sandberg, like Dylan, has the advantage of being a stronger player, moving people out of the crease, winning battles along the wall. That's where he has Dylan Sandberg beat. But I think Sandberg has Dylan beat on defending plays off the rush and kind of using his feet a little bit more to break the puck out a little bit. And I think yeah, they're, they're the same. They're the same. Yes, they're the same mold of defensemen, but they do it in different ways. Dylan's like a big, strong guy who clears the front of the net. Sandberg's more, you know, a great skater, tall, lanky, can shut plays down off the rush kind of thing. But I, I do think that because of that stylistic change, that Neil Pionk will benefit from it, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah but I'm, well. I'm with you on this. I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. This is this. I'm all in on Neil Pionk having a bounce back year. Let's finish it off here. My last hot take. And this is my first two are positive ones. This one's a, a negative one. I had to had to switch it up here, but I do believe this. The Winnipeg Jets last year won the William M. Jennings Trophy for the number one goals against team in the NHL. They're going to go from first to outside the top 12 in goals against this year. Yeah. Um, Connor Hellebuck, the last two seasons, has had a 920 and 921 save percentage. That is also not accounting for Lauren Brassois' incredible work as the backup last year. Um, they lost Dylan, like I just said, and I do think Sandberg's going to step into that role, but with Hanela and Stanley already injured, already already bound to miss time, I think the defensive depth is going to take a big hit this year. They bought out Nate Schmidt as well. 
And yes, he had his struggles last year, but he still posted strong results in that third pair. The penalty kill, how much do we believe in a bounce back for that unit? They were really, really bad last year, 22 or 22nd in the NHL. They had the 34 game streak of three goals or less. That's just not going to happen again. Like that was that was a historic run that won them this William M. Jennings trophy. And that was in the first half of the year. The second half of the year, they really struggled as a team, crept into the playoffs, all that stuff. But in that streak as well, they had a 14 game streak of two goals or less which also contributed to that goals against number. So I think it, not only are both of those not going to happen, but you're going to see some more high scoring games. And I think all of our predictions here kind of paint the picture of the Jets being a more high event team this year. Yeah. Um, like more goals against Gabriel Velarde scoring more goals, Perfetti having more points, things like that. Um, I think they're just going to be a more high event team this year. And I, I hate to bet against a two-time Vesna winner, but I do think Connor Hellbuck like you said, plays maybe less than 60 games this year. And in those 60 games, I think takes a little bit of a step back. So um, the Winnipeg Jets are going to finish lower than 12th in goals against going from first last year to outside the top 12. Jacob, what do you think? I agree with everything you said. And I want to bring to light what I showed you in the press box last night uh, when you were mentioning this. Last year, the first half of the NHL season, the Winnipeg Jets ranked fifth in scoring chances against and seventh in expected goals against. Second half of the year, they ranked 16th in scoring chances against and 19th in expected goals against. There was a considerable dip last year, people, at five on five, mind you. Yeah. Um, and I think that losing Brendan Dillon, not really having many upgrades elsewhere, uh, you know, Billy Heinola not coming in and being able to be a guy that can push the pace offensively. Stanley's, like, I mean, I just think that it's going to be a different look for the Winnipeg Jets. And, you know, you you hope that their power plays are to score more goals and they'll be a bit more offensive in that way. But I agree. I don't think that they'll be that stingy defensive team that they pride themselves on being last year. And it'll be a much different look in that regard. Yep. Yeah. And I do just want to bring up the numbers. Last year, they had 198 goals against. That was first William M. Gen- Jennings Trophy for the best team in goals against. 2022, they were 10th with 224 goals against. And 2021, they were 20th with 253 goals against. And obviously, Rick Bonus came in and changed the, the, the culture, the system, all these things that saw that gradual climb up to the top. And I'm not saying that Scott O'Neill is like worse than Rick Bonus as a coach in terms of X's and O's or anything like that. But I do think the coaching change is going to have some effect on the Jets' defensive structure a little bit. And there's also the argument that he was on the same coaching staff that cratered um, the de- the Jets' defense, like you said, in the second half of last year. So um, that's it. Those are our three hot takes. I'm going to roll through mine. Gabriel Vlardy is going to score 40 goals this year. Cole Perfetti is going to have more than 60 points, and the Jets are going to go from first in goals against to outside the top 12. Jacob, roll through your three again, and then we'll wrap the video. Connor Hellebuck will play less than 60 games. Nikolai Ehlers will be traded before the trade deadline, and Neil Pionk will have a bounce back season. So there it is. Thank you so much for watching to the end of this video. If you enjoyed it, hit the like button. Drop a comment down below. Which take do you like? Maybe you have your own hot take. I know you have your own hot take. So drop it down in the comments below. While you're down there, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. And join Jacob and I with Liz Hood this Sunday at 9 a.m. on the WST YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. And we will see you next time. See ya.